Cameo started its life as a very short design brief uh, worked on between uh, Tim Stamper and George Andreas, who was lead designer on the project. It's a game where you have talent elemental warriors and the interplay between the elements and the moves that they represent is the way that you unlock the gameplay. I know at the time um, Pokemon was doing its thing with the monsters and the collection. Very interested in stuff that Nintendo was doing, uh, very inspired by it as well. Uh, I think that always showed a lot in our work. The story of Cameo really begins when uh, Cameo, rather than her sister Callus, is given the element of power, uh, which allows her to transform into the fabled elemental warriors. Everyone expects Callus, being the older sister, is going to get it, and Callus herself gets a little bit jealous when Cameo is chosen instead. Callus is in um, league with Thorn, the sort of the evil protagonist. Uh, that has then sort of shattered the family apart, and Cameo's quest is to then go and find all of her lost relatives. Thorn, uh, the king of the trolls, who was turned to stone by, spoilers, uh, Cameo's father Solon. And uh, when Callus breaks that curse, Thorn sets about conquering the elves once and for all, so that his trolls, who can't use magic and are considered kind of brutish and stupid because they can't, uh, are going to have a chance at ruling the kingdom and taking what Thorn believes is their rightful place at the top of the food chain. I came to Cameo just as we started to move it from GameCube to Xbox because it had actually is a title that skipped a lot of generations. The very early work was done on N64. The team had just come back off of finishing Donkey Kong 64 at that point. The size of a team then was probably double figures, 15, 18 people. And we did start using concept back then. It just went with the flow as much as possible, but a lot of time we'd kind of just build stuff and review it. Writing the music to the game and the inspiration to the game, it was all just talking with, with George Andreas. I mean, it was very early on in the game development, and he was just like, kind of think, how would it, how would his game sound in a couple of years' time? As I was starting to write the music, I'd be writing it on the computer with my MIDI keyboard, and computer screens, and various music samples. I created a few like themes that'd be recurring throughout the game. Like these main characters would have some like theme or some instrumentation which would uh, represent them. The look of the warriors was partly influenced by their abilities. We had, everything was split into elements, so obviously the element influences the look of the creatures, certainly in terms of palettes and kind of materials, you know, you obviously expect water creatures are gonna look wet. The most fun part I had working on the soundtrack to this game was asking uh, Ashling Duddy to record the voice, her singing on top of the tracks. So I've got a, like a Manx dictionary. This is like a dictionary of the old Manx language. And I kind of flick through it to words that had something to do with a game. And then <laughs> I get the people in the studio, I'd put it on a piece of paper, maybe up next to the glass there, or I'd write it down and, and they'd sing that. And I can remember that first day when, she, when Ashlyn came in and we were just trying some ideas out. I played in a melody and she'd shaped that melody to just sound absolutely fantastic. So I was really impressed with what she did. Back on the GameCube, um, we showed the game at the E3 fairly early on, and we had this boss in there called Hydros. It was like this massive kind of plant boss. It was kind of like a Venus flytrap kind of mouth, but along the stalk, all down the stalks, it had like all these kind of creepy eyeballs and stuff, which was uh, influenced by Resident Evil, believe it or not. Towards the end of development, um, Microsoft said, hey, we've got the budget, if you want to, to go and record with the orchestra. So we asked the team, and everybody said, yeah, it'd be great. And so this was the first orchestral soundtrack that uh, Rare had ever recorded. So maybe like four months before the game came out, I swapped out all the MIDI sounds, all the MIDI samples that I'd been using in the game for the last few years, and I replaced those with a live orchestra.
some people felt when they played the game that the first level of Thorns Castle was almost overwhelming because it throws you in at the deep end. Uh, you have three warriors to control and Cameo herself. There's dragons, there's fireballs, everything's exploding and you start up halfway up an ice wall already being shot at. So one of the big things from a design standpoint with Cameo was the interplay between the elemental warriors. Getting the right kind of moves to give real differentiation between the characters while allowing the elements to play together was really, really important. It was about your warriors, it was about transforming and combining these moves, and it was about taking on hordes of trolls and huge enemies. If the game had started in the Enchanted Kingdom with Cameo waking up and jumping at crates and looking at torches, then a lot of people may never have really gotten to grips with what it was about. That kind of interplay and the subtlety of interplay became really important to sort of the later level progression and how the moves work together when you can rapidly change between uh, characters in a fight. So it became that, okay, I'm going into this fight now, I'm going to get ready for it, and I'm going to get the right three characters on my shortlist. The first of her warriors that uh, you, you get, and the one that most people remember, is Pummelweed, who is uh, a literal flower boxer. He has boxing gloves for hands, uh, he's very quick and pugilistic, he deals out rains of punches, and he can dig himself into the ground as well. The second warrior you'll get is Rubble. Uh, he's a rock monster, and he attacks with bits of his own body, which fortunately find their way back to him afterwards. Rubble can explode himself, and he can chip bits of himself over enemies' heads, destroy them from behind. Uh, he isn't one of the most powerful warriors to begin with. Until you upgrade him, he can only actually stun. But when you work him in tandem with Pummelweed, to stun an enemy and then rush in and punch it, is a really effective tactic. Certainly back on GameCube, there was there were going to be dozens of monsters and that gradually got cut back and back as we focused on making each one more thorough. We had all this kind of stuff where you would hunt down babies and catch them. It was, it was pretty in depth. You'd have to like watch the behavior of the babies to understand them, to work out a strategy of how you were going to catch them. You know, it, it just, wasn't as exciting or as interesting as we you hoped it was going to be so it kind of got paired back and paired back to the point where the baby catcher and stuff didn't really happen at all other than that you found the warriors when you did find them and rescue them from the shadow troll they were kind of in a baby form then i guess a big part of that was to make sure we got some use out of some of the work as well that was done there were also a couple of wind-type warriors that didn't make it into the game. One of them briefly got repurposed as an enemy before disappearing entirely into the mists of history, and the other was a cyclone-like creature that would have helped Cameo fly and attack enemies from above. Whenever you have a character that allows you to fly, you open yourselves up to all kinds of difficult possibilities, because if you can fly, you can get around pretty much any puzzle and any obstacle. So ultimately, the wind-type warriors didn't make the cut. It was sort of a technical challenge, but an asset production challenge as well, in that you've got this huge battlefield and you've got these huge levels, and we wanted them to seem really like they were alive and there was a lot of stuff going on. At that point, we were doing loads of stuff with particles, um, where we were cheating, we were like running particle simulations. The million particle room in Enchanted Kingdom when you walk into the throne room and there's just dust everywhere. That wasn't a million particles that was a hundred thousand particles because we did put a million particles in there and you couldn't see anything. Cameo was really interesting technically because as we said previously, it, it went across three different consoles. Technology changes quite a lot in that time. The Enchanted Kingdom, um, there's all of those plants, all of the grass waving in the wind, patches of flowers, all of the pollen and stuff floating around in the air. You can't have an artist go put all of those trees down, all of those plants down, all of those blades of grass down. So we, grew it where we'd mark up areas and say this is a lawn of this length this has these kind of plants in it and then we just let an algorithm go generate those and sort of save those assets out and then moving on to the xbox um, one of the big selling points of the console was that it had a built-in hard drive moving from cartridges onto discs you have all these new problems the xbox was interesting because they'd introduced a hard drive as a standard thing so we could kind of go back to being able to take advantage of being able to pulling data a lot faster. So that kind of gave us a chance to um, start doing more ambitious stuff again. Cameo was a cool game. It, you know, it was looking cool on the GameCube. It just got really amped up by the time we took it through Xbox. And then when we moved to 360, 
Uh, it was a whole different ball game. We definitely set out with um, Cameo on the 360 to make it a graphical showcase. Um, it's quite challenging because when people see bright, colourful, cartoony visuals, they don't necessarily associate it with um, high quality graphics. Cameo for me was a fantastic experience in so many ways. It was the first game I got to work on as a writer. It was the first game I got to work on as a designer. When a project finished after working on it for five years, it was like it was almost a little bit sad to like say goodbye to working with team members and you know saying oh, I'm gonna write music this week or sound effects next week. I think when the game finally comes together and your roster's complete in that final assault on Thorns Castle, that's when Cameo really comes together and uh, it was just a, a fantastic game to work on. It felt like a massive achievement to go across three different consoles and still release the game as well. I mean, that was an amazing thing to do. One of the big websites anyway had done a re retrospective like Let's Play uh, Cameo and gone and played it. Commented on how it had stood the test of time, how it played, what it looked like, even, you know, post 360, you know, now we're in the Xbox One generation. And that's really great that something's got that longevity and you have journalists now recommending people go play it 10 years after it was made. So I'm pretty happy about that. love a good making of, you love Rare Replay. You can also like and subscribe to feast on more Rare Reveal features right here, including the making of Perfect Dark and five things you didn't know about Banjo-Kazooie. Fill your big elf boots.